to order at 7 p.m. Mr. Aho, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Felber? Here. Mr. Salura? Here. Mr. Curtis? Here. Mrs. Davis? Here. Mrs. DeFabio? Here. All right, now that we're all here, if you could all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good evening and welcome again. Again, this is the board meeting for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019. I'm Rob Felbert. It's my honor to be your president. This will probably be my shortest president's report on record. I want to welcome the students, families, and faculty from Samuel Bissell Elementary and R.B. Chamberlain Middle School. Um, if you've been uh, watching some of the news, you know that we have a very important renewal levy on the ballot. Uh, it's issue five on May 7th. Um, and you know you've often heard the overused phrase it takes a village to raise a uh, a child but in this case it seems like we also have um, support of many other organizations so to date uh, twinsburg city council twinsburg township twinsburg chamber of commerce um, the uh, tea the teachers uh, education association northeast ohio education association and the twinsburg foundation to date have all um, shown support for this levy so um, this is a, another critical renewal. It is not a new tax. And uh, if anyone has any questions, of course, they can you know, reach out to any one of us. Um, our staffing is about 85% of our budget. And this particular renewal levy is 8.5% uh, of our overall budget. So very critical to maintaining the, uh, the services that everybody's come to uh, understand and believe in with the Twin Zerk City Schools. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Powers for the Superintendent's Report. Good evening, Mr. Felber. Good evening, Board of Education. Families, good evening. We're so glad to see everyone here. All of our students are here this evening, and we are here to celebrate some outstanding students here in our district. Uh, but before we get to celebrating um, students from Samuel Bissell Elementary School and Arby Chamberlain Middle School, we do have a, a couple of other announcements to make. Um, as I've said before, kindergarten registration is just around the corner, um, and uh, parents of children who will be five years of age before August 1st of this year are asked to visit the district website and then click on the four parents tab, scrolling down to access registration information. Once you're there, you'll be asked to create an account, and then you'll be asked to complete the pre-registration information, and then to schedule um, an appointment for yourself and your child. Uh, this is kindergarten screening, so not only are our parents coming the, on these appointments, but we're asking the soon-to-be kindergarten children to come, too. Uh, this year, kindergarten registration will be held at the Twinsburg Community Center, as it usually is, and we appreciate uh, Mayor Yates and Mr. Schroeder for allowing us to use their space uh, up behind the uh, swing pool. And this year, the dates for registration are April 15th, 16th, and 17th. And that's about uh, three weeks earlier than usual. So if you've been expecting um, registration, it's almost here. It's almost right around the corner. Um, and so we look forward to meeting all of our new parents and all of our students. And as I mentioned it before, this is the class of 2032 that will be coming through the doors at Wilcox Primary School. So it's a long time since I've graduated. Huh? <laughs> uh, so we look forward to meeting our new students and their parents and uh, are delighted. Uh, all of the preparations that are being done by Ms. Villa and her staff. It always seems to go like clockwork, so we appreciate Ms. Villa and her staff and um, our parents, uh, our PTA, who also um, come out and assist our, our registration process. Uh, Board of Education, as you know from my correspondence to you earlier today, um, this afternoon, um, Mr. Aho, uh, Mr. Welker, and I attended the regional meeting regarding the proposed Cup Patterson <laughs> fair funding model. Let me begin by stating that we are sincerely appreciative of the collaborative efforts facilitated by Representative Cup and Representative Patterson. Their bipartisan approach in addressing a long-standing problem with the manner in which education is funded in Ohio is certainly refreshing. Further, the fact that the proposal was developed by school administrators in collaboration with Representative Cup and Patterson is unique and valuable as school leaders know school funding the best. 
So we um, are asking Board of Education if you would kindly help us in getting the word out that this is a very um, important time in the history of public education. Um, they were mentioning today, and Marty can maybe <coughs> say a few words here too, that this is a legacy moment. And that um, when you're talking about fixing the, the funding of public education in Ohio, it's not an easy fix, and it's not a perfect fix, but people are working together to try to fix the problem. And so we do um, really appreciate the efforts of, of our Board of Education and um, our parents of reaching out to our state legislators to make sure that they understand that their work is appreciated. And although it's not perfect, I think this is going to be a very exciting time for public education if we can get this done. Uh, Marty, did you want to add a few words about this? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, they've come up with a nice model. Um, I think that the, it has the ability then to funnel funds uh, into special areas, which I think is kind of important. Um, so I, you know, I just think it's a good model. Right. So um, again, uh, the, the simulations were released just last week on Friday, and uh, our school district is optimistic about what might be. But uh, a reminder that this is all a conversation at this point. Um, it is not even a bill yet. Uh, what's going on is that the uh, representatives um, down in Columbus are hearing testimony from many, many different organizations uh, in support or not in support of the simulation models, and they will eventually determine whether or not this will be pushed forward uh, for possible consideration as law. And so um, the time crunch here is that the biennium budget is due to be completed, I think, the middle of June. So there is not a lot of time. So if you are a person that is interested in reaching out to our state legislators, I encourage you to do that, uh, to take a look at all of the press releases that have been happening. Um, if you look at my superintendent's message, it will be posted tomorrow. There will be more information out there. And I know that Mr. Curtis has been intimately involved in the effort. Uh, Mr. Felber has been, as well as the rest of the Board of Education. And so they're able to answer questions if you have them. Marty and I are like able to do so as well. So thank you for. Um, <laughs> First of all, being aware that this is going on in the state, it's really important that we are staying on top of this and that uh, we appreciate the efforts of those individuals who've been working behind the scenes to get it to where it is. And now we just have to get it past the goal line. And, and I'm very hopeful that that just might be the case. So thank you for your interest in that. Um, I didn't know if Mr. Felber or Mr. Curtis wanted to add any comments to that. I'm going to defer to Mr. Curtis. This is your world. No, you've done an excellent job you know, with respect to just prospects and the significance. Uh, at this juncture, given how long it has been. So uh, I appreciate that uh, you and Marty were able to attend and get a little more information, uh, a little bit more updated information. Sure. I, I would add that, you know, there are articles that have been out there. And just to reinforce what Superintendent Power said, this is a proposal. It's a conversation. It hasn't even gone to the Senator House. It's not a bill. So um, a lot of people like to count chickens before they're hatched. Um, we've been down this road with the tangible personal property for 10, 15 years of promises, and we ended up really, you know, nothing came of it. A lot of legislation, a lot of effort, um, and they phased it out, you know, despite uh, all the efforts of 613 districts around the state. So um, I guess it's, uh, it's like a roller coaster. Hang on. And I think the importance here is that it's not so much that the dollars have been dropped in. It's about the fact that they're talking about how to fix the for funding formula. Uh, because for many years our school district has been capped. Some school districts are, are what is considered to be capped and some school districts are on something called the guarantee. And so that we're not currently being funded in the, at the formula that is currently um, in Ohio. And so this is really important that they're having the conversation about how do you fix it? How do you actually determine what it costs to educate a typical child in a public school district in Ohio? And that's what the conversation is all about. And so if we can figure that out, and if we can ultimately uh, get the, uh, the support of the legislators and be able to push this into law, I think that we can finally answer um, all of the questions surrounding the default to the Roth decision of many years ago. So uh, we appreciate, again, your interest, your support, and uh, we'll continue to keep everyone posted as this uh, moves along down the road. 
Um, in other news, it is almost time for the Twinsburg Tiger Spirit Run. How's that for a segue? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, on Saturday, May 11th at 10 o'clock in the morning, um, it will be the date of the Tiger Spirit Fun Run. And Mr. Mark Bindis and our District Wellness Committee are busy at work trying to plan a morning of fitness and fun. Um, there will be a flyer on Flyer Central at our link off of our website that will give you all of the information that you need to register your family uh, to come on out for a morning of fitness and fun. And one dollar from the registration of all of our families will go to, from each of our families, will go to um, the Emergency Assistance Center uh, for all of the great work they do here in our pause on child hunger in the school district. So we appreciate Mr. Bindis and all of the members of our, our District Wellness Committee, and we hope that you'll be able to join us on it's on Saturday, uh, May 11th at 10 o'clock at Tiger Stadium. So I think I've spoken enough for the uh, evening and we have a lot of wonderful students and staff members to celebrate tonight. And so I'd like to um, ask Mrs. Johnson to please come forward as we celebrate wonderful students from Samuel Bissell Elementary School. And, and, and while she's coming down, I, I have the duty to uh, unfortunately say the fire code does not let us have people standing in the aisle. So I see quite a few chairs uh, up front um, they do check on us so for those in the back come on up front there's plenty plenty of chairs recognition program is on citizenship, academics, social, civic, volunteer, or other accomplishments that set the student apart from their peers. So at this time, we would like to proudly acknowledge, we're going to start with our second graders. So second graders, when I call your name, you're going to come up and you're going to shake Mrs. Power's hand. You're going to see Mr. Winter to receive your certificate. You're going to give me a hug, and then you're going to shake the hand of Mr. Felbert, and he will give you something as well. And when you're done, you're going to walk down, and you're going to stand in the front and hold your certificate very proudly. So let's start with Brooke Anderson from Mrs. Springer's class. Is Brooke here today? <laughs> Abby Depew from Mrs. Doyle's class. Catalina Hunter from Mrs. Robles' class. <laughs> Nev Modi from Mr. Robles' class. Azan Sadiq from Mrs. Finn's class. <laughs> Abby Wozniak from Miss Jolly's class. At this time, if we can give these boys and girls a round of applause. Nice job. Yeah. 
Isn't it so wonderful? I don't have to tell them how to smile. Look at those wonderful <laughs> smiles. <laughs> All right, did everyone get a picture? Awesome job. Okay, second graders, you can have a seat. Nice job. <laughs> and now for our third graders, Sadie Ashby from Ms. Belinsky's, Belinsky's class. <laughs> Sanjay Bowley from Mr. D's class. <laughs> Kelsey Clune from Ms. Belinsky's class. <laughs> Olivia Conway from Mrs. DePew's class. <laughs> Patrick Drake from Mrs. Rowan's class. Mariah Frederick from Ms. Mrs. P's class. <laughs> Giada Magnus from Mrs. Langhoff's class. <laughs> and Tristan Revere Green from Mrs. Langhoff's class. Nice smiles, everyone. Cheese. <laughs> Once again, if we can give these students a round of applause. <laughs> Very nice job there, Graders. You can have a seat at this time. And for our staff of the month, if I can have Mr. Hoffman come to the front, please. <laughs> Samuel Bissell Elementary School, our staff members. <laughs> our staff members um, nominate different staff, other staff members for staff of the month. So I would like to share with you what was written about Mr. Hoffman. We would like to nominate Mr. Hoffman for staff of the month. For many years, Mr. Hoffman was the full time guidance counselor here at Bissell Elementary. However, the, the past couple years, he had to split between Wilcox and Bissell. This year, we got Mr. Hoffman back full time. He has really done a great job coming back to Bissell full time. He puts a lot of time and effort into coming into our classrooms and teaching guidance lessons. He created a wonderful group called Kindness Club, and he does all kinds of lunch bunch groups for student students in the building. Mr. Hoffman plays a wonderful role as the fun guy whom the students feel safe and comfortable to go and see him or spend time with him when they need a break from the stresses of our demanding school day. He deals with so many different issues with a cool, calm, and collective leveled approach. Mr. Hoffman has been thinking of many different strategies and activities to start to implement into the school days so that the students are able to deal with all the pressures they feel. Mr. Hoffman sure is earning his keep and we couldn't think of anyone else we would want giving us the support he gives us. Thanks for all you do. And that was written by Mrs. DePew and Mrs. Haynes. Congratulations, Mr. Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Mrs. Powers. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. We'd like to ask Mr. Reese to please come forward as we celebrate students at RB Chamberlain Middle School. Good evening. Well, congratulations to all the Bissell students who were students of the month. I can't wait to get to Chamberlain to carry on the high expectations that we have. We 
got back from break and we're so busy. We have our school play. Our musicians are getting ready for OMEA contests. We have softball going on. Our baseball's going on. And we have well, about 150 kids who are going to be in our track team. And they have their first meet tomorrow. So we have to get a whole bunch of buses so they can, they can go run. And we also had our, our expectation meetings. When we, every nine weeks, we have our expectation meetings. We go over our expectations with our students. And these students tonight are students who always meet expectations. And our expectations are to our respect, responsibility, and right choices. So when you get to RBC, we expect you to be respectful to each other, to make right choices, and to be responsible. And this is what these students do each and every day. And starting with our seventh graders, we have Caroline Boskelly. <laughs> Samuel Wells McGrath. Genevieve Talentino. <laughs> Isaac Cantor. <laughs> and our eighth graders, Angelina Agresta. Seth Lierben. No Seth tonight. Caitlin Gannon. And Anthony Riad. All right, one more round of applause for our RBC Students of the Month. Now you, have to, you have to hold your signs up like, like Mr. Hoffman did, okay? With the big <laughs> smiles. <laughs> All right, thank you. Lots of great students to ce celebrate this evening. We thank you for being here. And Mr. Felber, that concludes my report for tonight. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Powers, and congratulations to all of our students. This is not only the time we go into committee reports, but it's also a good time to escape, unless you really want to stay escape. for the, I, uh, did I say escape? <laughs> we can't, but um, time to do homework, have dinner, all that. See if there's any committee reports from my colleagues? No, not this time. Right. Light round. So I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Superintendent Powers for the administrative reports. 
Thank you, Mr. Felber. Um, as you know, Board of Education, this year, uh, every year, we have district goals. And every year, we have a goal that talks about um, how well our students are growing over the course of the year. And this year, a little bit different. Um, as you know, Board of Education, um, by the quarter, we have been coming forward and presenting to, to you and to our community the progress that our students are making from one quarter to the next. Um, about a couple of weeks back, um, you requested uh, that we would take a different kind of look at the presentation this evening. And in particular, um, we were asked to um, create a presentation that talks about um, the growth that our students are making in, in, in a specific subgroup. And tonight we're going to talk specifically about students with disabilities. But I do want to um, just couch that with the understanding that in our school district, um, as Mrs. Traphagen will often say, all means all. And the programs that we're going to talk about this evening are not only programs that we um, are proud of presenting to you because they are uh, plans of inter intervention and assistance for students who, who may be struggling in school, but we also have programs, um, the same programs that we uh, are encouraged in, in the progress being shown by all of our students. And so I just wanted to make sure that um, we put that on the front of our presentation this evening that all means all and that the services that we provide our students are not based necessarily upon any particular disability or identifying label, um, but really it's based on where the particular child's needs happen to be. And um, many years ago, uh, the administrative team um, had a, a, a motto, and we still live by that today, and that is that we know every child's story. And with every child's story comes the need to make sure that we're almost prescriptive in the programming that we provide for the students so that we are assisting them to be the best that they can be at no matter what level they happen to be, no matter what grade they happen to be in. So I'm very proud this evening, uh, Board of Education, um, to invite to the podium members of our administrative team. And also this evening, you will see that um, we have the support of many members of our teaching staff because when it's all said and done, um, what happens in the classroom happens because of very talented educators who truly and generally care about the success of our students. No matter where they are, no matter what grade they are, um, these uh, teachers, these talented teachers, these talented educators from preschool all the way to, to grade 12 really um, have the hearts of educators and are here to do what's best um, by the students that we are so privileged and proud to say are tigers. So this evening I'd like to ask to uh, um, come first to the podium uh, Mrs. Jennifer Farthing, our, our Director of Curriculum, who will begin our presentation. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for having us here this evening for our third quarter Continuous Improvement Plan update, also known as the CIP. For those families that are viewing online, this is the third update we've had to the Board of Education for our Continuous Improvement Plan. Each fall, we collaborate to create our district goals. The student growth component is as follows. During the 2018-19 school year, the Twinsburg City School District will address the needs of the whole child through innovative programming while preparing students to be enrolled in post-secondary schooling, enlisted in the military, or be competitively employed. As that goal was approved, we wanted to make sure that we were moving the needle in the correct direction at every opportunity for every student this school year. As Mrs. Powers said, we do pride ourselves on knowing every child's story. I am pleased to be here with my colleagues this evening and would now like to turn the presentation over to Mrs. Denise Traphagen, Director of Pupil Services. Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent Powers. Tonight we're going bowling. And so you probably are thinking, why bowling? And what does bowling have to do with educating our students? All our building administrators, along with our teacher teams and Mrs. Farthing and myself, have been attending in-service training through the SST-8. This past January, we attended an in-service from Dr. Shelley Moore from Canada. And she, her presentation was on <clears throat> values of effective practices in inclusion. And tonight, as Mrs. Powers stated, we have a number of our teachers that 
both uh, regular ed teachers and special ed teachers because we believe all means all and each student is, we have to know each student's story and I am very proud to say ton tonight that these teachers attended these meetings, they have looked at the research and what we have to do differently in Twinsburg and tonight I'm using the, or we are using the analogy of bowling because at our um, uh, in-service training, Shelly Moore used this analogies to, to help us look at how we are serving students in the general ed curriculum and what do we need to do to change our aim to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students. And so we're borrowing this presentation tonight and at the end of our presentation, uh, you are going to see a three minute clip of Dr. Sh of Dr. Shelley Moore. And to let you know also that all of our building administrators have shown this video to all of our teachers. So for the purpose of our presentation tonight, I want you to think of the bowling ball as instruction and the pins as our students. And as you know, if those of you have bowled, that the hardest shot to take is the 7-10 split. Well, three years ago, and it, we recognized as a district that we were at the 7-10 split. We needed to make some changes in how we are meeting the needs of our students and our delivery of students and, and our delivery of services. We were rolling the ball up the middle and we were knocking down the pins in the middle, but we still had some pins standing. So we, needed, we, know, we knew we needed to do some things differently. So what we did is we embarked on some, some in-service training uh, through our SST because we know that a continuity of program is important to our district as students go from one building to the other. And over the past three years, all of our building principals Teams of teachers, which you see represented here tonight, and these are lead teachers that are dedicated to this district, and I am proud as a director of pupil services to be working with a strong administrative team and the teachers that we have here represented here tonight because they're doing an awesome job as far as trying to move the needle with, our stu with all of our students. The trainings that we started uh, three years ago when we recognized we had to do, we had, we had to, we had to do a different aim as far as, as, as the ball. And we first uh, visited the three, uh, the three years ago, the least restrictive environment cohort, and that was again in, um, uh, at the SST. And here we learned that w we need to educate our, all of our students as, as much as, as possible in the general ed curriculum and bring our services and wrap these services around these students in the general ed classroom and, and stop pulling them out. We also last year um, sent a group of teachers and administrators and Mrs. Farley and myself to uh, a co-teaching cohort with, and we also talked about universal design of learning um, through the SST, um, um, SST8. And to just to kind of define what universal design of learning is, it's a framework of how we look at the individual designing of instruction and assessment and methods uh, to meet the individual needs of our students. And the way people learn, we're all diverse. It was, it's as diverse as the fingerprints on our, as our fingerprints. And one of the things we have learned from going to these in-services, when we talk about our tiered services, we have a tier one, which is our universal instruction for all kids. Tier two, we look at targeted and we look at, you know, different small group instruction and those type of things. And tier three, our individual and uh, more intense intervention. And what we're learning from going to these um, uh, in-services is that the best tier three, which is our individual intense instruction, should be our tier one, that we should be meeting the needs of all of our students and, um, and um, supporting them in a multi-tiered as assistance. <clears throat> this year, continuing with the in-services our teachers have, have attended, we had the opportunity again through SST to, to invite some of our leading teachers, and these are hand-selected teachers by our administrators, that to go to, uh, to attend these meetings to implement, co-plan, co-serve 
throughout the district and this is the equity for all students and some of the research we looked at there was from Elise Futura and Colleen Caper from the University of Wisconsin and they are um, looking at a comprehensive system of equality and taking proactive steps for closing the achievement gap which is a framework and a process of, of advancing learning for all students and through this, through this, through through this training, um, we also the last thing that we looked at was again um, uh, the training of Dr. Shelley Moore, and she did her inclusion her training on inclusion, and um, we did two trainings in January, and we're going to be doing our third training with her next week, and you're going to see a lot of the things that she talked about in her presentation, uh, in the the. the um, the presentations throughout the evening from the administrators and the and the teachers. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to this slide. Um, this past February, Dr. Kim Monachino, who is the director of Ohio Exceptional Children for the Ohio Department of Education, uh, met with all the directors of pupil services across the state in, in our different regions. And what, it, what she wanted to do is she wanted to share um, <clears throat> uh, the Equality and Educational Research se Series and give us a snapshot of how Ohio is uh, identifying and meeting the needs of students with disability uh, compared to the nation. And as you see up there, the nation is at 13.2%. A, at Ohio is a little higher at 15.2%. And what we did as an administrative team, we thought it would be a good comparison to see where Twinsburg is as, as far as Ohio and, 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 the, and across the nation. And we are lower than both the nation and um, the, the state at 10.7%. Uh, so what this shows us is that the teachers here tonight and the administration is putting in place what we have learned from our in-service training and they're making a stronger tier one for all of our students. So thank you, thank you, thank you teachers. <clears throat> the next slide is our students um, value added data and this is from the uh, over the past three years we don't have our current data this year but this is over the past three years we have made progress in our aim of the of the of the seven nine split or the seven ten split but we still need to practice our aim and to reach our reach our goals of knocking down all those pins some of the practices that we um, still need to do and the aims that we need to practice include scheduling, common planning time for our teachers, and our caseload size of our uh, intervention specialists and our related services as, as they are very high. And so these are the three things that we need to you know, keep practicing at. And um, at this time, I would, uh, I would like each building uh, at this time, each building is going to share their data on closing the gap uh, that was shared with us in our individual CIP meetings with uh, Mrs. Powers and Mrs. Farthing. And we, then we will show a three-minute uh, video from Dr. Shelley Moore on the, on the 710 split. And then we're going to conclude. Now, because of time tonight, uh, we only had one group of teachers from one building um, is, are going to come and speak tonight. But as you can see from the audience, there are a number of teachers here that are share, uh, will be sharing in this, in this, in this same deli delivery of services. But because of time, we're only having one team um, present. So uh, the team will be from uh, Samuel Bissell uh, Elementary School, and they will be showing how they have changed their aim and are serving our, our children. But again, the last in-service that we attended at SST8 and was in, in March, March 20th. And I couldn't have been more proud of our administration and our teachers of what they brought forth to the table and what their plan is as far as meeting not only our, for all of our students. And it even goes further than that. All means all, but we have to look at each of those all and, and know their stories. And the passion and the, the thinking outside the box and the different strategies and the methods that they came up with, I couldn't be more proud. 
And so I'm looking forward to um, uh, planning with our administration and our teacher teams and for uh, next year. And again, we do have some barriers, and I stated that to my, one of the things we really got to pay close attention to are, is our class size for our intervention specialists and related services. And um, we've shared that across um, the, uh, the, di the district with our, with our administrative team. So at this time, uh, I would like to turn the program over to Lynn Bell. Hi, good evening. <laughs> um, for comparison's sake and to be consistent from building to building, um, we are looking tonight at the 2017-18 school year um, in order to be um, looking at state assessments and how we compare with that, what Ohio Department of Ed is saying. Um, before I get into the data that's up on the screen there, I need to kind of give you some background. Um, at Wilcox, our <coughs> preschool students and our <coughs> kindergarten students participate in a state assessment. Um, what you're looking at right there is the early learning assessment, um, and it is research-based. Um, it's given to our preschool students twice during the school year, but it is given the age of our preschoolers who range from three to five years old, this is not a written assessment or a computer-based assessment. It is not even an assessment that's done at a single um, point in time. Instead, what it really is is a formative process. Our teachers are trained to complete observations over time, looking at our students in routine activities and um, their normal classroom. And they are looking, and then they score them basically on a rubric about how they're doing. So. Um, the area that you're looking at up there is vocabulary development on the early learning assessment. This is a language and literacy area that Wilcox has marked for our own improvement. On this vocabulary assessment, um, teachers are looking for a lot of things. Um, now, put in a three to five year old in your mind. They're looking first for receptive language. Do the children demonstrate that they understand language? The next piece is expressive language. Can they communicate and are we looking over the years that they are with us in preschool, are they improving in their language, going from labeling things with nouns to speaking in phrases and eventually speaking in sentences? And that's how that progression moves along. We're looking for children to make connections from familiar words and phrases to things that are novel to them. Can they make those, those connections for themselves? Can they expand the use of verbs using similar verbs? So they may know walk, but eventually will they know jog and run and skip? And then finally, in this vocabulary section, we're looking at the identifying uh, more than one meaning for a word. So if you say the word duck through a three-year-old, you know exactly what they're thinking of. But there are multiple meanings to that word, and so that's that vocabulary development. So giving you that background, um, now we can look at the data. Um, so in this slide, um, fall, this is fall of last year. This is before our kindergarten prep program started. So what we're looking at right now are students from the integrated preschool program only. And about a little over 50% of our students in the IPP are students with disabilities. Um, about 53 students in that slide there. You can see that our students, um, our peer models, definitely outperformed our students with disabilities. Um, but this is not unexpected because our integrated preschool program is designed to identify those children early um, in, in their career so that we can get them into a language-rich environment and they can be exposed to the literacy and those foundational skills early on. So this is not very surprising. Some of those children are identified as early as two years old and they start with us on their third birthday. Almost 74% of those, third, of those children, 39 of them, um, began preschool below proficient last year. And that compares to, you can see the other, it's almost an exact opposite of the two, the numbers are a little different because we have fewer peer models. Um, but that compares to 26% of our peers who started um, preschool um, a little bit lower. Most of these students with disabilities are identified with speech language delays or developmental disabilities. When they are that young, we don't always um, give them a disability category that you might be more familiar with, like autism, multiple disabilities, Down syndrome. 
Um, so this, this data is not very surprising to us. This is why we choose strong peer models through a screening process, so that they can work with us so we can have this fully inclusive model for our students. What I think is more relevant is looking at the next slide, which is the spring of last year. And we look at this spring um, early learning assessment for our preschoolers. You can see that both this, the peer models and our students with disabilities showed growth. After nine months in a language-rich environment, we started to help our youngest students close that gap. The number of non-proficient students with disabilities decreased from 39, so that in the first slide there were 39 children. That orange piece there is 27 of those children. Um, what we know in preschool and at Wilcox is that um, we, we, we many times I think I have spoken to you about Dr. Dana Suskind and the 30 million word gap. Early and frequent exposure to all kinds of language improves school readiness and lifelong learning in every subject. At Wilcox, the journey starts with us. We're just starting them out. This is just the very, very beginning of their educational career. But from the fall to the spring of last year, you can see we made some gains. On our next slide is the other state assessment that our students participate in. Um, like the early learning assessment, our kindergarten students participate in what we call the KRA, or the Kindergarten Readiness Assessment. This is a little bit of a misnomer, because the things that they, they are looking for in the K KRA are really the kindergarten curriculum. Um, for example, on this assessment, teachers like the ELA, there is a component where they're observing students in their natural environment. And then in addition to that, the students take the next step and there are some pieces where they do it on an iPad or on a computer. So there are some of those types of things. But here are the things they're assessing in this, uh, this test. Prepositions, rhyming, recognizing letter sounds at the beginning of, of words, story elements such as character and setting, nouns and verbs, letter identification and letter sound correspondence. And even though they call this a readiness assessment, that is what we teach in kindergarten. Um, and this test is only given once at the beginning of the year. So and, um, similar to the ELA, it's scored on a rubric, but there are three areas. There's emerging, approaching, and demonstrating those skills. And once again, as it's not, not um, unexpected, our students with disabilities are still emerging in those areas. Um, but what is significant about this particular slide is that um, we are talking about 25 students in that students with disability column. The top portion there, that 64% is 16 children. The brown in the middle is eight, and the bottom one is, of the bottom blue part is one child. That is compared to the other column where there are 256 peer models. So one student scoring in one category really can affect that percentile, or that percentage. Um, we don't have a KRA at the end of the year, but we do know that our students are making progress because the teachers take this information, they take our kindergarten screening information, and then they work with the children at their level, as Mrs. Trapakin had shared, we, um, and we are monitoring them all the time through observation, through checklists, um, our teachers are um, creating assessments. They drill down. I watch our intervention specialists. They can drill down to the absolute skill that any child needs and find a way to make learning fun and creative and attacking those areas that, they, that they're struggling in. Um, so I, 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 f I look at this, and I, it's a snapshot. It's a beginning snapshot. It's not unexpected, because that's where they are. But I don't know that, it, to me, it, it isn't um, the most relevant data for us, because I know I see the growth. I see from the beginning of the year, where they can't write their name, and the end of the year, our kindergartners are writing sentences. And the more that we work with them, the closer that we get them to be fluent readers by the end of first grade when they're moving on to Bissell. Um, so these two assessments show where our students are at the beginning of their educational journey before we send them on to the next buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And as we continue to move the needle, 
Um, the one thing I, I try to uh, stay away from are, are the end result numbers, because when you just look at percentages, I think you miss the, the opportunity to celebrate the success of students as they make growth along the year, in the entire year. But once they get the BIS, so you heard um, Ms. Villa talk about some of the things they focus on at Wilcox. We continue that focus um, when they get to us, but the most important thing is we start out getting to know our students, understanding the way they learn, how they learn, and what makes them tick. And so that comes from getting to know their story understanding the learner that's in front of you and so our teachers spend a lot of time building relationships in the beginning understanding what it's going to take to move students and in doing so when our second graders come in and we get to know them we understand uh, where they are and what they need. And some of the programs that we have in place that are available for our, all students, but also we do target some students who are in uh, need of some specific skills. Um, some of our students are involved in uh, what we call our Tiger Camp, which is a center-based um, instruction. And students have the opportunity within that center base to have that intensive um, support as it relates to phonics building, as it relates to um, guided reading, as it relates to the structure of writing and certainly as it relates to vocabulary building and so those um, particular skills are intense at that particular in that tiger camp which happens Monday through Thursday for an hour and a half every day with that being said that's just not our students with disabilities we are also looking at those students who are struggling in those areas and they are uh, a part of that so that when they then, then go back into the regular ed classroom they continue that support in those skills in that setting Along with that, um, we do look at our students second and third. We did uh, Tiger Camp for second and third grade for many years. But as you heard Mrs. Trapp Hagen say, we talked um, and learned a lot about uh, inclusion and how important it is to make sure that we are exposing all of our kids to the rigor at the end of the year because come into third grade it doesn't matter if you have an identification or not you are expected to pass that Ohio State's test and so it's so important that we do our part in preparing them for that and in doing so uh, we have really looked at the co-teaching so when we first started a couple years ago and we started with our training we had teachers who then came back and trained our staff members and we talked about the importance of and you'll hear a little bit about uh, what inclusion really is so because for so many years we looked at what we thought we were doing a great job with what they title as integration segregation and in exclusion in some cases and so you'll hear a little bit about that a little bit later but what we're finding is that in, in, that inclusion piece including everyone in providing that tier one support that mrs trap Trap Hagen talked about that tier one support is so important because it's support for all kids and again it goes back to once you understand how they learn and you provide differentiation in your instruction and making sure you are uh, allowing allowing for students to have choice in some matters um, of how they can demonstrate their learning that becomes more important than uh, than just trying to uh, teach you the whole or aim down the middle as you heard mrs trap hagen say so with that in mind we began to learn more about co-teaching we began to um, pilot co-teaching so to speak um, and this year in second grade we have looked at co-teaching in some subjects and we have full inclusion co-teaching in third grade and you're going to hear the teachers talk about um, and give you some numbers in terms of uh, what it looks like for us this year as we're implementing that but not only that our, our teachers took a, a a leap of faith I should say and um, not only with new things that are coming about and taking them outside of their comfort zone, they also embarked on uh, the blended learning approach. And so then they began to look at not only the center-based learning, but also what works for kids. And believe it or not, at the second grade level, third grade level, kids, and when they're allowed to, to be given the choice or have input in their education, you'd be surprised how much they are engaged. We talk a lot about grit at our school and how it is important for our students to use their grit and to persevere and not give up. We'll come over to Bissell and you'll see that happening each day in each classroom. And so with that being said, those are just some of the things that we were beginning to take a look at and we're seeing some um, really good success with that co-teaching model, looking at all of our students and providing that tier one service for them and making sure they have the opportunity to 
opportunity to receive all intervention as opposed to just targeted uh, intervention and um, making sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our kids through those um, particular opportunities. And you'll hear a little bit more detail um, from the teachers when they come up. I don't get into numbers because, again, I think we missed the picture. But as you can see, um, our students with disabilities are not too far off from, our, our, from their peers. Um, our students are working very hard. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we say students, have, students with disabilities, we, we do IEPs and we have specific uh, objectives and goals that we set for them. But at the end of the day, they're responsible for the Ohio State's test. So I get a little frustrated with that, as you can tell. But we miss the opportunity to really celebrate the growth that they make over the year. And that's what I'm most proud of. But they do a nice job, as you can see, with the percentages. <laughs> So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm just always so proud of this opportunity because uh, I get the opportunity to hear like the continuity of programs for, from our Wilcox all the way through Dodge and beyond. And just the opportunity to see where kids can really grow because some of the same things that you heard from Wilcox and, and Bissell are happening at Dodge as well. Part of the thing we talk about kids that struggle and kids that struggle in general, whether they're students with disability or not, is that the most important thing are, are three components for me. And so when you're kind of looking at our data, it really comes back to quality teaching and learning, it comes back to looking at student growth, and it comes back to closing gaps for kids that struggle. And so when we approach students with disabilities, we're really looking at it from those three components. So when we talk about quality teaching and learning, it's not just teaching, it's not just standing in front of kids and making sure that you've delivered a message. It is really making sure that the quality teaching is connecting with kids. And I heard Mrs. Johnson say building those relationships to really make sure you understand what students' weaknesses are and strengths are and be able to build from there. And so when we're talking about blended learning or we're talking about uh, inclusion and co-teaching, that's what we're really talking about, the opportunity to really dig down deeper into what students' strengths and weaknesses are. At Dodge, we are really uh, proud about our inclusion model, our co-teaching model, because the essence of that is the opportunity to move kids into their targeted groups, look at their individualized strengths and weaknesses, differentiate instruction based on individual needs. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to reach the higher kids at that same level. But again, since we're talking about students with disabilities, we're talking about how we are able to dig down to specific strengths and weaknesses here. When you look at our, our math and reading data, what you'll see is that our students are doing pretty well compared to our state averages. Uh, but you also see that there's a piece where at this age group where we start to differentiate away from skill-based to application. And so when you look at the math piece in particular, uh, where the kids may struggle with some of like fact finding and things like that, as they get into fourth, fifth, and sixth grade in particular, it's we're looking more at access of knowledge, how kids are able to access knowledge, how quickly or how fluently they're able to pull strategies and skills out. And so that's a whole other layer of, 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 of their disability that we have to kind of address and work through. And so at this age, you'll see that, again, I think we're doing pretty well compared to, our, to the state reference. But at the same time, the most important part is we're looking at kids with where they are, and a lot of times they're starting below grade level, and are we able to get them a year's growth or more to help close that gap? And sometimes that may take a year or two to get, help close that gap, so that long-term piece. And I heard Mrs. Johnson talk a little bit about the, the uh, achievement piece, but the, our piece right now with, with students that struggle is closing gaps and moving, closing, moving that needle, as we've talked a lot about. When we're looking at growth, in particularly, we're looking at, again, taking kids from where they are, which could be one or two or three grade levels <coughs> below grade level, and trying to move them at that skill level. And so a lot of times we're targeting instruction around things that are not necessarily grade level. And so I think that is why that's so important to have an inclusion kind of model. And that inclusion model means access to grade level curriculum. And I think some opportunities when you don't have that access to grade level curriculum, gaps gain. Um, you may be able to patch some skills, but the gaps without that grade level curriculum gain. So that's why I'm glad as we've gone through our continuum of, uh, of experiences through the SST8, we're really talking about making sure kids have gap closing, access to grade level curriculum, and making sure that they're able to continue to grow and close gaps. Uh, when you look at our, our reading as well, we, I think we're doing pretty well related to the state as well. 
for reading is, is particularly a struggle for kids, students with disabilities sometimes because we're now talking about, you know, moving away from some of the decoding and the phonics-based pieces to being able to apply and, and comprehend. And so we're working closely with kids and on that comprehension and still closing those gaps. But again, we're also still making sure that we're maintaining that grade level exposure to content. The big piece at, at that point is that the, the readability of the text becomes more of a challenge for kids. And so as we're bringing kids into opportunities to, to read at the grade level and still close gaps is where we're um, focusing our attention for kids. Um, at, the end, at the end of the day, I, I'm just really proud of our, of our teaching staff too because they are really, really great at making sure that they have the opportunity to target kids that need it at all levels, making sure that kids feel like they're um, a component of the entire class and that they're not sing singled out and opportunities to work with peers at, their, at the appropriate level. And so we're really proud about the work that they're doing. And I, do, I think it does come across in the scores, but more importantly, it comes across in how our kids are re relating to each other and how they're navigating school. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, I want to start by commending our central office staff for the professional development they've provided for us over the past two years. I really feel it's high quality professional development in the areas of co-teaching and inclusion and will tremendously uh, help our students with disabilities in the years to come. I, I think we have to caution that sometimes change takes three to five years minimum to make and so some of the results that we'll see we're not going to see uh, for a couple years. I know when I got to Chamberlain 14-15 uh, our three-year value added for students with disabilities was an F and we went to a inclusive model where our students with disabilities start and end their day with their intervention specialist where we focus on uh, what you've heard relationship building number one and knowing their story social and emotional supports and then also in the beginning of the day we'd like to do what we call front loading and really preparing our students for the day and at the end of the day uh, some organizational some interventions and some help and we implemented that in 14 15 and then fast forward four years our value added score three year average now is a b and our single year value added score was an a for our students with disabilities so that means they are making significantly more uh, growth than expected uh, with with this inclusive model that we are now looking at district-wide <clears throat> Also our students with disabilities are part of our a for our gap closing they exceeded the performance index uh, for uh, The state the state criteria and so we're very proud of their performance index and the growth that has been made uh, in that area over the last couple years one of the areas that we are still lacking if you see on this slide and I think also the next slide the English uh, language arts slide is they are still not at the proficient level compared to their peers and so that is still an area for growth for us something that we're working on so even though they are making growth making more than one year's growth it's not enough growth to get them to the proficient standard that 700 on the OST test and that's not acceptable for us we're still going to keep working harder continue to participate in the professional development uh, what was really nice about the professional development for us it was some of the things we we're doing really was able to reinforce it like this is best practice these students belong in the classroom with their peers we have high expectations for them like all students in our school and we want them to be uh, scoring at the same levels as their typical peers so we still <coughs> have some work to do when it comes to our number of students proficient but we're very proud of their growth in their performance index and of their value added scores over the last couple of years good evening thank you so much for um, allowing us to have the opportunity to not only brag a little bit obviously but also to present to you what we think we're going to do to make a change, to move that needle. I do want to start and recognize my teachers. I mean, I, they're all sitting in the back because that's what high school does, right? <laughs> but um, this represents not just special ed teachers, in, 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 in intervention specialists, but we have several regular ed teachers as well as some academic coaches. And I think that kind of uh, demonstrates the commitment that we have that 
all means all, that every child matters, and that we are going to present a plan to you that is going to affect the entire culture and climate of the building in terms of who's learning and who's learning what. Just like Ms. Johnson, I hate this slide, and I hope next year when I'm standing up here, the slide looks significantly different. And to address the, ch uh, the problems with that slide, we've, we are putting in at least five different, uh, um, I don't want to say interventions, I don't want to say programs, I don't want to say plans, but we're doing things differently in five different ways. One is in December, thank you for your um, funding of it, we started the OST Blitz, where we took students who were not currently enrolled in a class, but they had not passed the OST last year that were special ed. And we gave them in math and English language, Algebra One, Geometry, English Language One, English Language Two, kind of a wrap around, deep dive, we're gonna get you through, we're gonna make a change in your OST points so that you are closer to graduation, trying to kind of kill two birds with one stone. And the OST Blitz results came out um, a, a couple months ago and we couldn't be prouder of them. 80% um, improvement in Algebra One of the students that took the OST Blitz for that and 75% of those were special ed students. So that's, that's an incredible change. 74% improvement in geometry with a 60% improvement of our special education students. 86% improvement in English 1 um, with an 83% improvement with our students with disabilities. I don't even want to say the last one. 29% improvement in English 2 with only a 16% improvement in special ed, but that causes us to reflect. Like what is the difference between ELA 1 and ELA 2? What, what is the obstacle right there between ninth and 10th grade and English language? So it, it's an opportunity to reflect and change. But overall, I think our growth um, using that model um, was really, um, it made us feel good about what we were doing in the classroom, how we were using technology, all the different um, softwares that we have available to us that help the kids learn. And so I'm really proud of, of that effort. We've also implemented, as you've heard over and over and over tonight, um, not implemented, but tweaked, continued to use the co-teaching model. M many of the teachers in the audience are using that. Um, we've attended three sessions of co-plan, co-serve, three sessions of inclusion. We are changing the way we schedule next year so that our special education teachers that are co-teachers will have intentional planning time with the regular ed content level teachers. I think that's critical. Um, it's not enough to just know that how to take notes. You have to know a little bit about why we're taking the notes and how is it important to the content. Um, we're also in implementing common planning for all of English and all of math. So fourth period white will be all English teachers will have common planning. Fourth period blue, all math teachers will have common planning. It's not an easy task to do that. Um, it takes a lot of work because we also have to include our special ed teachers in that common planning. Um, but I will say that has been a, uh, an exercise that has involved the entire school and has increased the leadership capacity amongst our teachers. They have taken that schedule and made it work for the kids, for their planning, for the content, for the you know, end result of a test score. So I think they know they've been working on that worksheet I gave them. You know, I had to give them a worksheet just like you do to kids. I need this worksheet by Friday and I need it filled out and nobody can be wrong. But, um, but we're making it work. So all of those things have been um, important. Earlier, Ms. Traphagen talked about her three things, common planning, which we're doing, class sizes. The scheduling has also, we have really tightened up on the scheduling so that class sizes and math and English are going to reflect the need that those kids need in a classroom. We need class sizes of 21, 24, 25 if we want to move the needle. We can't have class sizes of 28 where we have special education teachers kids in a co-teaching scenario. So our, our commitment is one-third of those co-taught classes will be special ed, two-thirds will be regular ed, and we'll be learning from our peers, and we'll be raising the expectation, raising the bar. So scheduling is, is critical. Co-teaching is critical. Common planning is critical. I think at the end of this year, and more importantly at the end of next year, because when those things actually go into place, you're going to see, I hope, huge gains. Um, but most of it is due to the work that our teachers do every single day. So I, I want to get off that slide. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm with Ms. Johnson. Now this slide um, represents um, students with disabilities in Ohio that are exempted from graduation requirements. They can choose um, a different way to achieve graduation. Um, and the state exempted 20% of all special ed students from the normal graduation requirements. If you look at the next slide, you will see what Twinsburg did. We did not exempt anybody. Every special ed student 
is held to the same standard of every regular ed student. And I think that's, that's important. That is a message that we need to celebrate because that says all does mean all and what our students are expected to learn, all students are expected <laughs> to learn. And we're not gonna try and remove them from the, from the larger category to make our scores look better. Um, so we exempted no one. Holding the district to the highest standard possible, that requires um, testing scores, uh, testing and scores in Algebra 1, Geometry, Biology, History, Government, everything is included in our report card. We're not hiding anything. We're completely transparent with what we're trying to do. I think that speaks more to a district philosophy th than it does to my philosophy or to our philosophy, but it's a trickle-down effect, and it makes me proud to know that every kid that we are working with is going to be held to that um, standard. So we can stay on this slide all night if you'd like. I like it. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. So in conclusion, first we'd like to again thank our teaching staff who are here with us this evening. And we're going to uh, see if we can watch this video on the 710 split. And then we have some teachers who will close the program for us. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strengths in our diversity. <coughs> this value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with development disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be philosophically versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I gonna explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we can have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end and they stare at you. It's the 7-10 split and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball was the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can, the pins are left standing, we often have another chance to kind of get to them, but at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring looking at you are our kids who need the most support and our kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling. Who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They throw the ball down the lane at a curve. And I was actually really curious about this, so I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. <laughs> he said the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pins. We are not taught to teach to the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often, the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pens, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change our aim. Look how bowling changed education. So one of the things that um, really stuck with us is, is that analogy. Um, when we showed it even to our teachers, and I can only speak for Bissell, but everyone showed it, and I'm sure everyone had that, that response that you're having right now, like, wow, mm -hmm. that was powerful. And so what you're going to hear today is, uh, you're going to hear a little bit about Bissell, but this is um, something that's happening 
in all the buildings. The commitment that these uh, staff members have that are here today um, is, is just um, more than I, I have the words to explain. Um, at the last meeting we were at listening to the teachers and their passion and, and their motivation to just go back to their buildings and, and make good decisions and, and select good um, lessons and, and diverse in, in, in their teaching and, and tapping into the different modalities and making sure that they are reaching all kids. It was just powerful. You heard Mrs. Traphagen talk about it, but you really had to be there to, to feel it, to hear it. And so we have two representatives from Bissell today that'll talk a little bit about um, not so much 710 split, but it will be incorporated in what they will speak to you about. So at this time, I will call Mrs. Hill and Mrs. Kinsella to the podium. Hello. Uh, my name is Kristen Hill, and I'm the intervention specialist. And I'm Elizabeth Kinsella. I'm the third grade classroom teacher. Um, we this year have been teaching in full inclusion in the classroom setting. So with having the opportunity to attend all of these amazing trainings um, over the past couple of years, we've been provided with the information that we felt we needed to implement co-teaching in the third grade. So this year, um, for third grade, the two intervention specialists primarily work with two classroom teachers. So between ourselves and our instructional assistants, we are in the classrooms throughout the entire day. So as we have transitioned from our specialized instruction from the resource room to, um, to co-teaching, we have um, some exciting things we have learned and we've seen that we want to share with you. So first, of course, is growth. Um, in previous years, when we've um, done our services in the resource room, we have the data, we saw the growth, but what we're seeing is we're starting to collect our spring data now, is we're still seeing that same growth with all of our kids. So from the beginning of the school year, um, in guided reading, when we've taken their um, scholastic guided reading levels, um, our students from the beginning of the school year till the end of March, so March 22nd, right before spring break, we've seen um, 10 out of 24 students that have doubled their year's growth in reading. Um, this includes special education 504 students that need um, reading interventions throughout the classroom um, day. We've also seen 10 out of 24 students move up um, three levels, which is a year plus growth, not quite the double growth that we saw with the other 10, but they've moved up um, significantly. Four out of the 24 students have also met that year's growth. So we had no students that did not meet the growth. So everyone made their growth for the year. And the best part about it is we still have two more months to go. So we're hoping for even better results by the end of the year. Um, of that, five out of six of our special education students had met that indicator of three or double. So they made more than a year's growth, if not double the year's growth in this span of time. So another great observation that we've seen this year is that not only um, with our special education students, not only are we seeing them highly motivated to complete the same work that their peers are completing, but we're also seeing them build their confidence, their confidence in answering questions, their confidence in reading aloud in class, because they're so used to being around their peers now that now we've created this sense of family in the classroom. And we're all together. We all work together. And it, it's just been awesome it's been so awesome so to add a little bit more to that when in years past when I was teaching in the classroom um, Mrs. D Hill or another special education intervention teacher would come in and um, have students leave the classroom to go to a resource room or to work on things and the relationship building was not as strong this year what we've seen is that there are so many peers on every level in the classroom that are helping each other out. Um, it might be one day where a student is struggling with a task where they're just not so sure of what they're reading about and another student will offer to help that other student to get through the activity. We're seeing a lot of more like peer mentoring that's going on and a really large movement in the classroom of ownership of their learning. So students are taking that ownership and there's times where they'll work a problem out that we thought we might need to support, but they're, they're jumping in and helping each other out in ways that we could never imagine. So that ownership of learning has been incredible. 
And the last observation that we want to share with you is in years past when we would work in the resource room and we'd pull our students, we'd work primarily just with our caseload. So it could be anywhere from 11 to 16, 17 kids. Well, this year, with working with two classrooms, we get the opportunity to work with almost 50 kids and help 50 kids learn. And it, that has been another rewarding experience. And just working together with Mrs. Kinsella and really team teaching, using all the different models that we've um, learned through these trainings. Um, sometimes she's up in the classroom teaching, I'm walking around. Sometimes I'm doing the teaching, she's walking around. We do a lot of center work in the classroom. Um, sometimes we do parallel teaching where I will, or we'll split the class in half and I'll take half of the class to my resource room. She'll do the same lesson in the classroom and it's just been a wonderful experience. And so the fantastic thing about that is that it's not um, how it was in the past where the students always knew who was going to be working with the interventionist versus the classroom teacher. Now there's days where we even have students that will say, I can't work with you today because I want to work with her. And we make that work. And we're, we're able to do a lot of quick thinking on our feet to, to help students in the mood that they're in, in that present time of the day, and to see what situation might be the most beneficial. Um, the other really great thing is that we are able to break down lessons into such smaller mini units because we have two teachers that are reaching everyone. And so in, in a typical guided reading setting, it would be one teacher in the classroom with one small group of students with multiple students working independently. This year we're able to target two groups of students at one time, which gives us multiple opportunities to reach students within a day. Because we're, we're actually almost double dipping in the educational academic um, environment. And so that's really been fantastic for us. So if you look up at the um, PowerPoint, and you see that the bottom three circles are explanations of what exclusion, segregation, and integration look like. And these are all models that have happened at some point in the educational system. So exclusion is where you have your general classroom where they're considered normal students um, in the green. Around it, you have um, students of various disabilities that would be in a resource room or not included into that general classroom setting. Segregation is also where you take that group, now you're putting them into a smaller group in right within the general classroom, but you have them separated out in that area. Integration, you're bringing them into the classroom, but there's still that focus that those are students that are not necessarily a true part of the classroom. So what we've done is we've really focused on that inclusion this year, and it's very hard for some of our students to even recognize that there's another student with a learning need that's sitting right next to them because we've made it such a fluid um, academic learning environment that this inclusion has now um, become the normal and become the, the mainstay in our classroom so that the st students are there to help each other and everyone has a weakness, everyone has a strength, and we focus on everyone's weaknesses and strengths together to help bring everybody um, to make the most growth that they can possibly make. So this is the last slide, and this is something that Shelly Moore shared with us at one of our trainings, and it really, when I saw this, it really, it hit my heart really hard here. So the, there's cupcakes, and you have a cake. They're both made out of the same batter. The cupcakes represent all the different services. So if you need help with reading intervention, math intervention, speech, OT, um, it, the multi-layer cake, has all of those all together. Instead of giving out one, two, three cupcakes to a select group of students, how powerful would it be to hand out a slice of a multi-layer cake to any student, to every student, where they can choose the, the support that they need to be successful? That's it. Oh, no, I forgot. Oh, yeah. I forgot. This is literally some food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you for bringing up dessert so early in the no. evening. I had to remind her of that. It was just so cute. We could have like used a cake, you know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we would just, I'm not sure what the presentation is, but we would like to thank you for your support and for thank allowing you. us to speak to you this evening. And again, one last thanks to our staff for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We, we certainly appreciate, you know, not only the tremendous work that went into the proposal, uh, the, proposal the, um, the presentation, but also, you know, really the work that's happening uh, at, at all levels and uh, uh, really could feel your energy and excitement and how, how things have changed, not only for your work environment, but just as importantly for the students. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to hit you with questions, so I don't know if colleagues have specific questions, but Jen's used to thinking on her feet. Does anybody have anything? Specific that they want to address. That was very. Uh, um, actually, I do. Um, the two young ladies that were just up. What I'm interested to know. Um, very familiar with, with co-teaching, and, and oftentimes it, 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 you know, people say that they're doing it, but they're really not doing it. Uh, and what you just described to me sounds like you're doing it with fidelity. Uh, when, when kids don't know who the kid is with the disability in the room is, and they can't differentiate between you, the intervention specialist, and general ed teacher. Like, that's that's well done. What I'm interested to know from an instructional standpoint, just if you can just give me some example of kind of how just a typical lesson, if you would. Um, I don't want you to teach a lesson, you know, but what I'm interested, <laughs> what I'm interested to know is just, it, it's just, it's just your implementation of, of co-teaching model because again it's people say it's done in a lot of places they say that they're doing it but they're not doing it mm -hmm. uh, and clearly you understand it you grasp you, you get the concepts you understand the end result and clearly suits are responding to that and the first thing that popped in my mind is that okay well you know what specifically are you doing you know to, uh, to make that happen so one of the things that we do for um, our daily fiber guided reading is we have the students, or we all break up into centers. So one of us will be leading the guided reading station, and then this year, the other one of us, we were um, leading maybe the writing station, or we were leading a reading skill station where the other students were working independently on vocabulary or computers or word work. And so that's just one model and then they would we would rotate centers or we do we rotate centers do they have the choice uh, to rotate or like in blended learning or is it more controlled so um the students are in groups um, based on either their um guided reading level or on a skill based level so we did change that um according to what we felt the focus needed to be um and then weekly we would switch so it wasn't like one of us was always doing guided reading and one was always doing writing so we would be switching the pace <coughs> of things which also helped from the teacher's perspective of planning and workload too so like we were we were always like dipping back into what um what other needs the students n had so that we weren't just focusing on writing with students or just focusing on the reading we had the opportunity to both focus on both um and then as far as it would go after a reading block of time when we were teaching math what we do is um, it's very fluid we both teach at the same time if there's if if we're walking around the room and we notice that a student isn't understanding a concept or is maybe not grasping it in the way that they need to um, the other teacher may just right there interject and say hey here's another way to look at this or um, hey mrs. Kinsella you know I noticed that um, a couple students over here might have not understood exactly what the concept was. Is there another way we can explain that? And then we kind of all brainstorm as a class wow. in order to understand what's going on. So it's more of a conversation during the day than it is like a teacher, leader, and an assistant. We don't want the kids to have that feeling that one of us is not um, equal to the other because we are both very equal and I think more often than not we look at each other as knowing more than the other so I'm always thinking I wish I knew what she knew and then she'll say the same thing to me so we kind of we share that load very equally and the students can see that
we had to train them on understanding the different types of co-teaching because it's more than just um, pure level teaching or, it, or it's more than just one model that you can use. So we had to have an understanding of that. But what's more important than anything else is allowing them the common planning time. Yeah. They have to be able to plan together to be able to have that fluent teaching that's happening every day. And they also have to be able to work together. We're finding that, you know, sometimes the match is not there, but you don't know that until you try it, right? So we're experiencing some of that um, as well this year. So it helps us, too, to get a better understanding of who works well together, how we are going to look at that schedule so that planning time can happen. And in addition, we need to make sure that the same people are working together on a regular basis year after year because it takes time. And a lot of the training that we've heard, these teachers are working together three and four years, so they're comfortable with each other. They almost know how to, know how to complete one another's sentences. Um, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And when I walk into the classroom, I see what they're saying. They're up there teaching, and it's just bouncing right off. The, the other one is bouncing off the other one. Or they're in small group with kids, and, and, and you see it happening. But again, it takes time. We just in the beginning um, phases, we're seeing a lot of um, growth in our students, in our teachers, in that um, team teaching that's coming together. But most importantly is being able to have that common plan I also just wanted to add that with me working with Mrs. Kinsella and then one other third grade teacher. So in the mornings on Mondays and Wednesdays, I spend my entire morning with Mrs. Kinsella's class. Cool. And then my instructional assistant is with the other classroom. Okay. And then I spend my afternoons with the other teacher. And so we flip flop and it, okay. it's the, the um, continuity and the schedule has also worked really well too. Thanks. All right. uh, Board of Education, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, it, things like this don't happen um, just on a whim and a prayer. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of professional development. So we certainly do appreciate your support of providing opportunities for our staff. Um, the leadership team here really understands um, the need for professional development, and our teachers have really embrace the, the thought of working together in these co-teaching um, strategies with the right kind of um, formula such as this. We're seeing great growth um, in our students and in their success at school. It is about having the best talent in the classroom though. None of this would happen if it wasn't for the individuals sitting before you and their colleagues who couldn't make it this evening. And the co-teaching model that is um, relatively new in our school district um, is relatively new and we're learning as we go and um, with the learning um, comes sometimes the need to plow through the grit that you heard Mrs. Uh, Johnson talk about um, but the end result and we all realize it is the high performance of kids and meeting them where they are taking them to their very next best they can be and so we appreciate your interest in what we do um, I appreciate everyone who is here tonight and all of the hard work and dedication um, that you um, give to our kids every single day, the leadership team here, uh, and making sure that the staff has what they need in order to do the best work that they do. So thank you one and all for being here this evening. I do appreciate all that you do, and um, I know that our students and their families do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Powers. Um, well, we are going to move on with our regular meeting, but uh, did you? yeah, I was just going to say, if they want to go just as uh, the other students of the month, you know, dinner, homework, you know, co-planning. Uh, Mr. Aho, do we have any cards for remonstrance? No, sir. All right. No. You have to stay. All right. I'm going to move on to uh, H Treasurer's report. H1, resolved that the Twins Board of Education approves the following meeting minutes, regular meeting of March 20th, 2019, as sent to the board under separate cover. Is there a motion for H1? So moved. Okay. Moved by Mr. Slur, a second? Second. Second by Mrs. DeFabio. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Slur? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. And H1 passes 5-0. Moving on to action items personnel. Without objection from my colleagues, I will read I1, 2, and 3 together. 
I want to resolve that the Twins Board of Education accepts the certificated licensed personnel and or contract recommendations detailed in the attached exhibit as per the dates, terms, and other applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory ORC background checks. I too resolve that the Twins Board of Education accepts the classified personnel and or contract recommendations detailed in the attached exhibit as per the dates, terms, and other applicable, applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory ORC background checks. Finally, I-3 resolved that the Twinsburg Board of Education accepts the supplemental contract recommendations detailed in the attached exhibit as per the dates, terms, and other applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory ORC background check. Is there a motion for I-1, 2, and 3 as read? So moved. Uh, well, Mrs. <laughs> Davis, is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Curtis. Any discussion? I don't think we have anything particular to draw attention retirement wise so um, Mr. Aho roll call please. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mr. Solera? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. And we'll move on to action items J. Uh, I will uh, request that we break out um, J7 and 8 uh, separately. Uh, so I will read without objection uh, J1 through 6. J1, resolve that the Twins Board of Education approves the attached listing of technology items to be deleted from inventory per the attached exhibit. Two, resolve that the Twins Board of Education approves the below listing of items to be deleted from inventory. Three, resolve that the Twins Board of Education approves a contract with the education alternatives for one student for the remainder of the 2018-2019 school year in the amount of $6,384.00 as sent to the board under separate cover. Four, resolve that the Twins Board of Education approves the program site agreement with the Alliance for Healthy Youth to provide healthy relationship risk avoidance education for RV Chamberlain Middle School and Twins High School for the 2019-2020 school year as sent to the board under separate cover. Five, resolve that the Twins Board of Education approves a proposal for the overnight extended student trip for fifth grade students for George G. Dodge Intermediate School to travel to the Henry Ford, Ford Museum in Village in Dearborn, Michigan. One group will travel May 2nd and 3rd, 2019, and one group will travel May 30th and 31st, 2019. The trip will be paid in full by the students, parents, as sent to the board and under separate cover. And six, resolved that the Twins Board of Education approves the rental agreement with the University of Akron to use the Edwin J. Thomas Performing Arts Hall on Sunday, June 2nd, 2019, for the purpose of the Twinsburg High School commencement for the class of 2019, as sent to the board under separate cover. We have a motion for J1 through 6 as read. So moved. Mr. Curtis moves. Is there a second? Second. Se second by Mrs. DeFabio. And discussion. Talking graduate, you're talking start of the night, talking about kindergarten, and we're talking about graduation. Wow. Um, Mr. Aho, roll call, please. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mr. Salura? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. No six items past five zero. Moving on to J7 and 8 without objection, I'll read those two together. G7 resolved that the Twins Board of Education approves the consultant contract with Hennis Communications, 50 Public Square, Suite 3200 in Cleveland, which sets forth the rates and terms for communication consulting services for the Twins City School District as sent to the board under separate cover. Eight resolved that the Twins Board of Education approves a contract with Hennis Communications of Cleveland for consult consultation services for the development of a comprehensive crisis communication plan for the Twins River City School District for the terms and conditions set forth in the agreement and at a cost not to exceed 25000 This is a city county fund expenditure as sent to the board under separate cover. Is there a motion for J7 and 8 as read? So moved. Moved by Mr. Slur. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Davis. Uh, for a matter of discussion for my colleagues and, and for the general electorate, um, I've known Mr. Hennis for probably 20 some years. Probably did business about 15 years ago. Um, haven't since, haven't probably 
physically seen him in a number of years, but I will be abstaining just uh, just due to that uh, relationship. Um, his reputation is is very strong in this field, um, but I just thought it was proper knowing that I've known him for that long. Um, had nothing to do with uh, this uh, communications contract being uh, sought forth and um, executed by the superintendent. So I don't know if you, from a point of discussion, if you have uh, further explanation. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, Board of Education, as you know, one of the four goals for the school year talks about the development of a comprehensive communication plan. And part of that um, plan has to have a piece that is talking about how we would communicate with our constituents should there be a crisis in the district. Um, Mr. Aho and I had an opportunity this winter to participate in the Ashland Leadership Series, and during those co uh, courses, those classes rather, uh, we had a chance to um, hear a presentation by Mr. Hennis and talk, and he spoke directly about um, school districts that he have, has helped manage some crisis situations, as well as uh, private business, both um, in the state of Ohio, nationally and internationally, and and um, the wealth of, of knowledge that he would bring to the district in helping us plan for the worst day if that should ever happen, and we hope it never does. But um, if that were to happen, we would want to make sure that our communication um, uh, plan is, is put together. Um, in the worst case, there's not time to sit and write a narrative for a Blackboard Connect call. There's not time to figure out a chain of command if I'm in Columbus and Chad's somewhere else and who's supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And so what we want to do is to work with Mr. Hennis's organization to create or develop a crisis communication plan that will be very strong, that will be very confidential because certainly in these matters, um, confidentiality is important. But leading on his experience in the field, um, we believe that the contract will provide for our school district another layer to our, our crisis management plan that we are already pretty proud of. This just gives us another layer talking specifically about the communication piece. So we appreciate your consideration this evening. Thank you. Further discussion or questions? Roll call, please. Mr. Salura? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mr. Felber? Abstain. So J7 and 8 pass 4 0 with one abstention. Uh, moving on to 9, no more than 9. Uh, summer of 2019 roofing project resolved that the Twins Board of Education approves a proposal with Garland DBS of Cleveland for the summer 2019 Twins River City School District roof replacement and repair project at RB Chamberlain Middle School through the U.S. Communities purchasing consortium for the terms and conditions set forth in the proposal and at a, a cost not to exceed $169,191.00. This is a permanent improvement expense as sent to the board under separate cover. Is there a motion for nine as read? So moved. Moved by Mr. Slora. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Davis. Someone's going to have a busy summer. Mr. Walker, anything to add particularly? <laughs> All planned for and, and All part planned of for as part of the budget and, and uh, looking forward to starting at the summer. Right. And we can't do safe, warm and dry <coughs> if we don't start with the roof. How's right. that? Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion? <coughs> Roll call. Mr. Salura? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. And that item passes 5 0. We are at K miscellaneous. Anything from my colleagues? Superintendent. Um, Board of Education, um, earlier this evening, actually before our <coughs> meeting, uh, Mr. Uh, Reese and Mr. Holland and I were actually over at Kent State University's um, Regional Academic Center, and Mr. DeFabio was there. Uh, Mayor Yates was there. Um, Mrs. Uh, Megan Eberhardt, the Executive Dir Director of the Chamber, was there too. The reason we were there, we were invited to listen to a presentation about a, an exciting opportunity for um, some of our students here in the school district called the Rising Scholars Program. And uh, Kent State University is very interested in partnering with our school district to provide uh, what I'm saying is the golden ticket for a number of our students. And, and it goes like this. Um, beginning with um, this year's sixth grade class, uh, the university has asked us to identify two students um, who would be considered to be first generation college students. Um, these students would be students who would be qualifying for our free and reduced lunch program. And these are students who have the drive and motivation to do well in school. 
Um, we would be working with Mr. Holland and his staff um, and Mr. Reese and, and myself and Mrs. Farthing uh, to identify uh, two students uh, that we think will do well in the program and we'll recommend them to Dean Spalsbury at uh, Kent State University. Uh, beginning next year, um, those students will be their first cohort. Uh, students here, there are two students that will be in that class, two students in Nordonia and two in the Berkshire School District, so six. And so um, the university is going to be paying ment for mentors to work with these uh, students, our two students for the beginning cohort. And they will follow the students through their career here through 12th grade. Upon graduation, if the students so desire, those two students will be given a college tuition free at cost to their family at Kent State University. So this is a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, uh, it is being supported, I'm understanding, through grants and through the uh, partnerships of our local businesses here in town. And we are very excited and delighted that Dean Spalsbury has selected the Twinsburg Schools as an area that she wants to uh, give back to the community through the Rising Scholars Program. So uh, later this week, Mr. Reese and uh, Mr. Holland and I are sitting down um, taking a look at some recommendations from our sixth grade teachers, identifying students that we think may have the right stuff to do well in the program, and then making the recommendations to Dean Spalsbury and her staff, and the students will begin in the program uh, next school year. So very exciting times. Um, this ca came sort of out of the blue, and so we're very excited to partner with Kent State University uh, to provide an excellent opportunity to a couple of our Tigers. And I'm um, to be told that every year two additional students will be selected. So they, they will grow the cohort over time. And as those students graduate from Twinsburg High School, they'll pick up the, you know, the next group of, of students. So uh, super excited and we're looking forward to um, seeing some great opportunities happen for some of our students. Yes, proud of my alma mater of Golden Flashes. Don't, don't leave anything <laughs> left behind. That's awesome. Excellent, anything further in miscellaneous? Mm -hmm. Um, the board does have a deed for executive session, so I will make a motion that the Board of Education enters into executive session at, what is it? Oh my. 46? Uh, 844. To discuss the employment and discipline compensation of public employees as per the Board of Education Policy 0166A, <coughs> and to review the negotiations with public employees concerning their compensation and other terms and conditions of employment for Board of Education Policy 0166E. I've made that motion, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Curtis. Any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mr. Solera? Yes. Mrs. DeFabio? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. And executive session uh, L passes 5-0. We are now in executive session. We do not anticipate further business when we 